Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome VMware to the My Broadband Cloud Conference 2021. Lee Seiss is the Senior Cloud Solution Architect for Cloud Providers Sub-Saharan Africa at VMware. Lee, it's great to have you with us. How are you doing? Thank you very much, Aki. Great to be with you and, and really fortunate to have the opportunity to, to chat to everybody today. Well, listen, we're living in interesting times, and I'm sure the last 18 months has kept you very busy. Please do tell me a little bit about VMware and the services that you guys provide. Awesome. That's that's great, Kaki. So, so yeah, VMware is a, a software development company. I think the core of our services that we developed was the hypervisor. So that's what was our claim to fame in the market. Um, we're fortunate enough to have that hypervisor spanned across multiple customers in a broad ecosystem. Of, of customers as well. So where I specifically sit in the business is around an evolution of where the company is going towards. So we evolve from a product perspective, moving from a hypervisor to software defined computer, uh, software defined storage, software defined networking and so on. But I sit in a specific business unit where we don't really sell software. Okay. So what we typically do is we have a rental model where we provide software to partners in order to deliver a service utilizing our technology. So whether that be cloud hosted services, um, utilizing our SaaS services to offer managed services on top of that, but it's really in that cloud provider ecosystem um, in that business unit is, is where I fit in. Well, it's very exciting. I mean, I've attended a few of your conferences and, uh, um, you know, and just been following the incredible growth that VMware has had over the years. And, you know, you look at where you guys are positioned right now and you look at how the cloud evol is evolving. I think that you are very well positioned. Now, when we talk about a one size fits all approach, my question to you is why a one size fits all approach does not work when considering the cloud? Is, is that a realistic question? Yeah, I definitely think it's realistic. And if we look at a lot of the vendor um, statistics and so on, this multi-cloud world is, or this multi-cloud world is, show, is thrown out quite a bit. And I think it's, it's quite realistic to think that there's going to be different endpoints used. And that typically comes out of scenarios whereby a customer might be looking at something like collaboration and Microsoft might be a fit. Um, it might be in relation to serverless computing or database services and AWS might be a fit. Um, it might be looking at the traditional hosted three tier architecture monolithic applications and private cloud might be that fit, which is where VMware was strongly positioned. So at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself looking at multiple consumption mediums across multiple clouds. It's not going to be a scenario where, okay, I choose this vendor Microsoft, or I choose this vendor VMware, or I choose whatever vendor, and it's going to be an all in on that vendor because you're going to find yourself coming up with use cases where, where other vendors or other cloud technologies is going to need to be used where it's not fit in, in the choice that you traditionally had in, in your mind. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Lee, at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, one of the things that comes up over and over when, you know, people talk about their cloud journey, etc., is agility. And what you've just been talking right now is that it gives you that agility and the flexibility. And that's exactly what you need when you're moving into the cloud and you're moving a lot of operations into the cloud and you're lifting stuff. I mean, agility and flexibility is really key key here. Now, when you look at cloud operations and management in a multi-cloud world, is there an elusive single pane of glass? So that single pane of glass is an interesting word. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of the world word in all honesty, Aki. And I mean, to the previous statement that I made or to answer your previous question around why a single or is there a fit for purpose cloud for all use cases? At the end of the day, multi-cloud is a complex scenario. It is, it, it, it's not a simple thing to do. And looking for a single tool as a, a cookie cutter approach to take all this complexity and make it simple, it's not, I don't think it's a reality. Mm. I think a logical way of looking at it is actually a Gartner magical wheel um, around cloud management that has different pillars of competency for cloud management and operations. And what it typically does is it looks at certain competency areas. So as an example, if you're looking at backup as a pillar, there would be one tool that might be a single pane of glass for backup into multi-cloud. Right. Um, if you look at another competency, it might be automation and provisioning there's a tool that would be fit for purpose for that use case. Or if you're looking at cost management, there's a tool that will be fit for purpose in that use case. So it's typically a scenario about single pane of glass, where and for what. There's gonna be multiple single pane of glasses that you, you're looking at. So dealing with it based 
on a competency or challenge that you have is a more logical approach to take than looking for this one tool that rules it all and does everything. I think that tool, it's, it's not likely that a tool like that would exist. All right, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, uh, and a lot of people use that single pane of glass analogy, but uh, I guess that, uh, you know, the cloud is evolving continuously. And I think that we re evaluating all of these kind of things. Why is a private cloud very relevant and where should this particular be located? Now, you look at the backdrop of Popey. I mean, this is a very, very contentious issue. Yeah, and I mean, I'm very passionate about private cloud. I think that's the the, the bread and butter for VMware. We, we're really strong in that private cloud space, and I think that's why we're still such a relevant business. So if you look at, if I just refer to VMware as an example, our private cloud construct, we use a term called VMware Cloud Foundation. And essentially what that is, it's taking constructs of a dedicated platform that a customer has and adding cloud operations onto it or a cloud consumption operations portal on top of it for compute, storage, and networking. Now, it's an interesting fact of where private cloud should sit, because one could argue that a traditional hosted site in a customer's data center is private cloud, where we think that the definition of private cloud comes into play is around um, having more elements software defined to give more of a cloud operating portal towards it. And I think the benefits of private cloud is around that security aspect. Um, it gives you a different a uh, consumption model. It's not always utilization from a, a workload perspective, but having a, a element of costing around the infrastructure being more predictable. You wouldn't really get these spikes it's around that predictability. Mm. And where it could be placed, VMware's got a, quite a nice story around that. If sovereignty, and I think we'll come to sovereignty a bit later on, but if sovereignty is a requirement and it needs to be in the data center for latency requirements, that private cloud could sit there. Um, I think building your own data center, there's not many customers who, who have a server room where, where they place their private cloud instances often. So if you had a relationship with a co-location partner, that private cloud could sit there. But in a lot of elements as well, the fact that customers are using private cloud so broadly, and there's this lift and shift to cloud type scenario that they're looking for to move closer to hyperscaler, VMware is fortunate and in a very fortunate position to have private cloud instances in the hyperscaler data centers as well. So hyperscalers have come to us because they see the value of partnering with VMware and the value we bring to private cloud by putting VMware Cloud Foundation's version of private cloud inside their data centers. So in AWS, you'd find it. In Azure, you'd find it. In their data centers, you'd find it. Oracle, Alibaba, um, IBM, all of the big hyperscalers, you'd find a VMware private cloud there. So I guess it's based on a use case. If it was a sovereignty latency thing, it could sit in the edge or in a colo data center. If it was a scenario where you're looking to bring your traditional applications closer to your hyperscaler workloads, then we have those private clouds in those instances. But it would be use case dependent and we have the flexibility of having VMware Cloud Foundation everywhere and giving that choice of consumption where, where you find it fit for purpose. I mean, are, are there security and risk concerns with uh, the public cloud? So, yeah, I mean, security is is something that it, it can be a broad discussion if we could probably sit here for two hours chatting. Yeah, about absolutely. Security, okay. <laughs> but security is an interesting aspect because I think a lot of people who look at cloud kind of forget that it's a data center sitting somewhere else. It's the fact that it, it's in the clouds doesn't mean that there's, there's no location that it actually sits in. And also the operating around it doesn't change that much as opposed to every, as if it was in your own data center. The difference is, is that it's offered as a service. So things like the shared responsibility model needs to be clearly looked at. You can't overlook um, like defense in depth principles around protecting your perimeter or per, uh, utilizing firewalls, using antivirus, using encryption. Um, those type of things still needs to be considered. And if you don't consider that, yes, there is a security risk when it comes to cloud. And also looking at things like if it's a card service, are, are the cloud providers PCI compliant or are there certain ISO standards taken into play it would give you that comfortability around the security that or the compliance that you, you have when moving into that cloud environment. But it's, it's very important that that shared responsibility model is understood. If that's overlooked, there could be security concerns. But if you, if you look at that validated designs and you make sure that your architecture is put into place in a secure manner, those things could be overcome.
All right. Uh, and I think security is such an important issue. I agree. That's something that we can talk about for ages, but uh, security is really, really critical in this age of uh, the cloud that we're living in. Now, what do you think of the uh, latest intent for cloud and data policy that government uh, would like to implement? It's quite a controversial issue. What are your thoughts? So I personally think it's it's a positive thing. I guess different people would interpret it in their own way and perhaps use certain elements to their advantage or the narrative that they, they're pushing. But in, in my opinion, I think it's it's actually an excellent thing for the country as a whole. Um, I'd use an example of, of what's happening in Europe. So looking at the, the GDPR type act, um, the law that was passed in, in Europe, and I'll, I'll relate it to that. That has been quite positive. That actually started evolving an initiative that is being launched in, in Europe called Gaia-X. Not too sure if anybody's heard of Gaia-X, but that's creating like a, a, a federated government cloud between different Europe European countries. And I think data has a lot of value. And this is really bringing to the forefront what that data actually means to a lot of South African organizations. As a banking institution or a medical institution, the data that you're generating is of value. And I think there's a big difference between data residency and data sovereignty. And if you look at the big challenge that, that hyperscalers have at the moment is they are resident. Yes, we have availability zones in South Africa, but it doesn't always necessarily mean that they're sovereign. And what sovereign or what resident means is that the data sits here, but account information, metadata, there might be third party services that's consumed that gets pushed out of the country. And when you're looking at certain acts like the US Cloud Act, which links to the Patriot Act, if there's certain criminal activities that suspect, uh, that's uh, suspected, the US government has the authority to basically have a court interdict to access data because it's a US owned type platform. Now, as VMware, we've got a really good sovereign story to tell. So the business I look after, we created a branding um, called VMware Cloud Verified, which is basically representing sovereign or partners who's built their own sovereign clouds locally. So yes, VMware is an, an American organization, but those cloud verified platforms are not mm. VMware owned. VMware technology is used on the back end, yes, but it's not VMware operated, VMware run. So it's South African organizations that have built clouds inside South Africa, which is sovereign. The data is local. They've put additional security um, um, enhancements in place to make sure that the data is encrypted. There's no metadata leaks and so on. There's certain air gapped environments where required. So I think it, it's really bringing to the forefront the value of data. And I think it's necessary to, to understand that not all data should be leaving the country. Not to say that hyperscalers shouldn't be used. They have a value proposition. They there, they have a, a good story to tell. But when it comes to the extra level of security, I think private cloud and utilizing a cloud verified partner local in your country adds a lot of value. So it really speaks to what was being written and what was being displayed in that the document that government released. If I'm not mistaken, it was around about April. Yes, yes, that's right. Now, that's a very interesting perspective there. Why do you think a managed service partner can fast track cloud adoption and management? Because you often hear about that. Um, and what, are you, what is your thinking around that? So I think managed services partners are, are really key to a CIO strategy around digitization. And creating a, a, a true business partnership is filling that gap around trying to in-house all services is, is quite difficult. If you look at the technology that's being released, the look at just some of the services that's on a VMware Cloud Verified Partners um, platform, or if you look at the services that's in the hyperscalers, it's quite broad. I kind of find it funny when a lot of people release, okay, I've got these amount of certifications. Mm -hmm. You can't be a specialist in each area and everybody's publishing, okay, I'm certified in this, I'm certified in that. It's a good thing to get certified because it gives you visibility of the services, gives you an understanding of what's out there in the market, but you cannot be a specialist in each area. And a lot of organizations are not going to build a complete competency around certain specialized skill on each of those areas. It's, it's quite a massive thing to do. Partners out there who concentrate on managed services, that is their bread and butter. That is what they focus on. That's the investments they make. That is what runs their business. So they're going to make that investment, spend more time than a typical in-house IT department could typically do in majority of the organizations. Not saying all organizations, but majority of organizations. So if I, if I 
think of a managed services partner, it's almost like an evolution of outsourcing. It's not that much different, maybe just new skills required or new approach being taken. But partners are going to be pivotal in order to help you through that digitization journey to move your company towards a digital um, company and utilize the technologies or the advanced technologies that's out there by taking advantage of the true functionality that it provides. So it can really speed up your process by not make or forcing you to invest in that skills and certification of your own people, getting things done a lot quicker because those investments have been made already. And they spend a lot of time trying to get those investments made. And that's what's going to be at the end of the day, run their business. Yeah. And of course, there's a lot of complexity out there. So I think that when you when you talk about, uh, you know, the the management and you talk about managed services, um, I think it's really quite critical when you talk about the kinds of investments that you're hearing people making into the cloud. Lee Sais, who's the senior cloud solutions architect for cloud providers, Sub-Saharan Africa at VMware. Lee, thank you so much for joining us at this year's My Broadband Cloud Conference. It's been a pleasure having you and chatting to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Aki, and thanks to everybody who's joined. Um, really fortunate to, to be part of this event today. Thank you. Go well.